cross where my Savior died. Down with cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where He took me in. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. Come to the fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge it today and be made complete. Glory to His name. Let's stand. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood of If you were here last week, if you weren't here, you probably know the story. If you've been around church for a while, but we talked about the, the great battle on uh, the, the, the mountains, right? Where uh, Elijah, God through Elijah defeated the, the prophets of Baal and Asherah, 850 of them. That's pretty bad odds if you're the one, unless you're the one plus. And, and the one plus who? Jesus. I wonder what the statistics will be on those who win the eternal battle with Jesus and those who won't be. I, I pray that it's not 850 to 1 going and 850 being doomed and damned, but I'm afraid it's going to be more than that. Narrow is the way to what? Salvation. Even though it's bought and paid for, for who? Everyone, all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So it's, it's there and it's available, but, but it, it's not going to happen for so many because refusing to accept Jesus as Lord. Uh, it's interesting that after winning the battle, he was gracious in his victory. Are we gracious in our victory over sin? Christians, are we gracious? What I mean, do we offer grace to the ones that don't think like we do? Not always. That's a, that's a good, that's a truthful answer. Do we want to? If we offer grace to other Christians who have already received grace, what are we doing? Patting ourselves on the back, right? It's not that we shouldn't be gracious to one another, offering forgiveness and those kind of things, even when it's not deserved. Amen? Imagine if churches did that. <laughs> How many wouldn't be run off already? <laughs> but we offer forgiveness even when they haven't asked for it. Uh, remember, he didn't give us conditional grace, our forgiveness. He died for us before, while we were still sinners, right? The only condition to receive it is saying, thank you. Yes, you are Lord of my life. I do believe in my heart you were raised from the dead. And the Bible says you shall be saved. Amen? But sometimes we have conditions on forgiving others. Now, forgiveness is not the same as trust, and that's a whole other story. Amen? How many of you know somebody you forgive them, but you can't trust them? You're not going to give them your credit card. You know what I mean? It, it, that's, that's just not intelligence. But, but forgiveness is a different thing. You don't want malice for them. You want the best for them. And, and that's where that's at. Anyway, well, we find that uh, after winning the battle, after getting rid of the false prophets, what did the Bible say to do with people who prophesy falsely? In Deuteronomy, it, it says to kill them. They're telling people how to miss heaven and hit hell. And you say, well, that's, that's mean. Well, hell is mean for eternity. Amen? Uh, when, when we're battling cancer, how much do we want to leave in our bodies? No, and if it's going to destroy more, then stop it. And, and so you can say, well, that was mean. No, that was grace to take these liars out of the picture. Now, that's not our job, but that's how it was handled at that time, right? And, and then what did, 
What did Elijah say to Ahab, the one who was trying to get him? And I know some of you are coming in on the middle of the story. But he said, Elijah said to Ahab, go up and eat and drink, for there's the sound of an abundance of rain. They've been in a three-year drought. We've been in a three-month drought. And we know how that feels. So imagine a three-year drought. But it was to get their attention. What were they doing wrong? They were worshiping a false god called Baal, which is short, believe it or not, for Beelzebub. And they've put that together where they say Beelzebub. And, and so we see that in the New Testament. Right? Uh, anyway, the battle took place. All that was done. And now he's being nice to, to Abraham, Ahab and go get you something to eat and drink. Because you've got a, 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 the rain coming and there's fixing to come. You know, the roads are going to get slicked. You know how people are. They put their flashers on and you don't know what they're fixing to do and all that kind of stuff. He doesn't want him in danger going back. Now what was Ahab going to do to him for these three years? And his precious wife, Jezebel, <laughs> I say that facetiously, right? What was he trying to do for three years? To kill him, <laughs> hunting all over for him. He was hiding out of the brook. He was hiding at a widow's house that was starving. And he brought a, a, a young man, God brought a young man back to life through him and all kind of stuff. And in, in in, actually in Jezebel's backyard up inside him. All this was going on. And, and now he's, he's won and, and the, 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 uh, the uh, drought is over. It says, Ahab went up to eat and drink and went up to the top of Mount Carnal. Then he bowed down to the ground. He put his face to the knees and, and he started praying and a cloud of rain came. And so after, the, after that happened, after, in verse 45, now in the meantime the sky became black with clouds and there was a heavy rain and Ahab rode away and went to Jezebel. Then we find out something. Elijah is an athlete. How do we know that? The hand of the Lord came upon Elijah and he girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. And I've heard different distances, either 6 miles or 15 miles or 25 miles. Either way, I couldn't run any of those, right? But, but Elijah could. And, and that ended chapter 18. That ended chapter 18. He's had a major victory, hadn't he? How are you after a major spiritual victory? I mean, where, where should we be at after a major spiritual vi victory? We should be elated, right? Mountaintop. I, I can tell you a couple of times when I've had a spiritual... Uh, I, I, I was interested in Ms. Opal called the, the ladies' uh, uh, Bible study a mini rev uh, revival. I'm not sure if you could have a mini revival. If you revive, that's a big thing. Amen? But there were fewer in number, but I think y'all had 11, which was great. And y'all kept it to one hour, right? That's okay. I was timekeeping. Just, just for my own benefit, I noticed that y'all went longer than I do sometimes. Even. So, anyway, which is a great thing. Y'all were having a, a good fellowship and or a fellowette ship. How do you say that for ladies? Never mind. Uh, anyway, you should be elated. God came near, right? You got to see, you got to have fellowship with other people with the Holy Spirit. Everyone who's received Christ, trusted Christ, believed in Christ, the Bible says receives the Spirit. And so a great thing, when we don't let everything else get in between, we stay thinking about Him instead of any other division type problem going on. So where should Elisha be now? He was outnumbered just in the clergy, 850 to 1. He had the king there and obviously would have his military and stuff with him. I still hadn't quite figured out how they let Elijah execute all those others. Because remember, some of those were kept by uh, Jezebel. Now he's got to go home and explain to Jezebel what happened to her prophets that she was paying for. I think 400 or 450, or half of them were, were paid for by her, ate at her table. You think Jezebel's going to be happy? And y'all know the story if mom ain't happy? Okay, that, that kind of a deal. And he let it happen. Right? And, and all we know doing the executing, and the only one that mentions is Elijah. So, huge victory. A, a lot of stuff happens. Got to be, it's been a three year campaign from the drought, beginning of the drought to this end of the drought. It should be great. But now we're in uh, 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 1 Kings 19, and it says this. Elijah told Jezebel all that Elijah, I mean Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Just, just tell you a little ahead of time, Mama's not happy. 
Okay, look what it says. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so let the, I'm going to say this, little g gods. You see the little g up there? The little g gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. So what did she just say? 850 to 1. Elijah says, bring it on. Ahab and his armies, bring it on. Little uh, marathon run after that, bring it on. But now Jezebel's mad. And so what does he do? When he saw that, he arose and ran for his life. What's missing here? What's missing here? Right? Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for what you're teaching us, Father, in, in every part of it. And I pray, Father, today uh, for, for those of us that need to hear it, and, and I, I believe we all do, Lord, uh, it, the, what specific message that you have for us. Speak to us through your spirit, through your word. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Have uh, any of y'all kept up with Coach Joe Kennedy? Not Joseph Kennedy, the father of uh, JFK, but Joe Kennedy. If y'all remember, he was finishing a football game on the high school field, and at, uh, when people left, he'd go out to the 50-yard line, and he got to where some of his students would go, and so they fired him. And uh, they took it in these eight years, to the, finally up to the Supreme Court, which means it through the, went through the lower courts, and it finally got to the, that place. And, and he won. That's a pretty good-sized battle for a high school coach. Would you agree? I mean, how many funds does it take? Many Christians supported it and, and, and paid for the lawyers and all that to get it all the way through. And, and I read about it right after it happened. It says quite a victory because it, it protected what is supposed to be a guaranteed right of freedom of worship, freedom of speech, all of these different kind of things. But they were really down on it. And, and then finally... I think it was last week or a week before last. They played the first game, and I think they won. I'm not sure. It didn't matter to him because he went either way. And, and after the game, he was able to go out because they reinstated him there and got on the field and he knelt and prayed. And that was some headlines, various places. After the battle, he had the battle won, a huge battle again. Uh, if you've been a public school teacher, to, to take on something like that is, is, is scary to say the least. And eight years of not knowing how it was going to come out until that Supreme Court thing. So they reinstated him. The next headline I read this week was he either retired or resigned. And you, you wonder why. And, and he said, I thought they'd be happier to have me back and, and so it's probably better that I go now. You know, he got some sick folks in, in Florida and basically he's looking maybe and he implied that he's going to be looking into the ministry. Uh, for those things. And, and uh, his lawyer came out after that and said, he's a former Marine, said, uh, he, and he, he said that he was tired, basically. He said he didn't tell you all these other things, but here's what it said. Uh, the lawyer said that that happened there. They banned him from team meal. If you know, they get together and they, they have uh, different kinds of meals, one for the team, then one where the coaches meet and have a dinner and stuff. They banned him from that. They didn't invite him to the coaches' dinner with the opposing team's coaches. They wouldn't give him a locker. His key fob, I'm assuming they gave him access to certain things would, wouldn't work. Uh, they wouldn't let him be into certain meet meetings. They didn't give him a coaching assignment during the game. So they reinstated him, but he was, oh, and they didn't want him to talk to the head coach during the game, and they didn't want him to talk to any of the players. Does that sound like a coach? And it's start the fight all over. But what if you've been doing this for eight years? It's a major victory. It was something worth celebrating. And it was a victory for everybody who believes in free speech and, 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 and uh, freedom of worship, right? But where do you think he's at now? Exhausted. Why? Now, the judge can say you're reinstated, but can you legislate morality? How should they have treated him when he came back? At the very least, as an honored co-worker, right? But how did they treat him? You may be here, but you're not here. Cold shoulder, basically, right? And he could stay and fight, and then what would we remember him for? 
and, and, and to try to coerce it through the courts, was it going to happen? So I understand that, but isn't it kind of in the same spot like Elijah? Major victory, and when he gets over there, what did he win? Have the people changed? Has the situation changed? The day before they were hunting for him to kill him, and the day after they're what? Hunting for him to kill him. The, the, the temples of Baal, you remember Baal worship and Asherah worship? We, we talked about it. Uh, one of the things for Baal worship was uh, child sacrifice. Horrible things going on. Uh, uh, temple prostitution, where they bring slaves in to, to, to do this and call it worship. You know, what's amazing what people can call worship, by the way, thankfully, there is a limit to that in, in freedom of worship here. Amen? Hopefully, it will stay that way. But we just said Baal is, is a term short for Beelzebub. And, and we, we read the scripture last week when anything sacrificed to little g gods is actually sacrificed to, to demons. So the Bible explains all of that. So what does he do? He's tired. He's exhausted. And so he goes on a marathon run, right? Same as his coach. He's, I think he was Washington State, and now he's headed to Florida to re re retire there from teaching anyway, to, to move on. Now, is, is Coach Kennedy done? It, it, for any Christian, are we done? Do this. How many of y'all did that? Okay. If you're still breathing, you're not done. You're still on mission. You're called to be an ambassador from the kingdom of heaven, aren't you? What was... I don't know what Coach Joe's expectation was, but what was uh, Elijah's expectation after that huge battle where it was clear? Remember what he said? Choose this day, right? Uh, which position you're going to wind up with. If it's God, let it be God. If it's Baal, let it be Baal. And hands down, everybody saw it was God when the fires consumed the altar, when the rain came after three years. It was God. But the next day, what? Everything's the same. 850 less false prophets, but has that changed anybody's ideas? We don't see that it has. So what does he do? He ran for his life and he went to Beersheba. Well, if you don't know, Mount Carmel's up in the northern part. The, when it was the divided kingdom, that was known as Israel. In the southern part where Jerusalem is was known as Judah. He left up here at Mount Carmel and went down about 60 miles or so to the very southern part of Judah where Beersheba was. On foot, after running a marathon, right? So that, that's where he's at. Uh, when he got there, he left his servant there. <laughs> How would you like to be in his servant that day? Where are we going, boss? Follow me. 60 miles, right? And he gets down to basically the border of Judah, on the edge of the wilderness, and he tells him, stay there. But he himself went a day's journey further. said, back then on foot, you might make 20 miles a day. Okay? They might. They might make 20 miles a day. I would. But anyway, depends on who's chasing me. But he, he himself went, went a day's journey into the wilderness and came under a broom tree. Sometimes called a juniper tree. But it's actually not a tree. They, they said in that place, it's a bush with sparsely limbed places. In other words, it's not a great shade tree. But when you're desperate, what will you use? Whatever you can get. And he's desperate. What's he looking for under that tree? I mean, there's places without a tree, but he's under this sparsely thatched uh, 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 juniper tree, broom tree. And, and what's he looking for? Why did he go under there? Why didn't he just lay down out in the sand or the rocks? Some sort of comfort, would you agree? A little peace there. The day before, up against the king of 800, all that kind of stuff, right? But today he's run this far, and, and now he's pretty desperate to come to that point under this tree. He's so desperate for comfort, he's going to lay under it. And look what he prayed. And he prayed that he might die. Let me, I'm not the smartest person in the world, but if he wanted to die, he could have stayed there and had supper with Jezebel, right? I'm, I'm sure he'd have been an invited guest. I mean, if he wanted to die, then you could have quit at, at mile marker 5 or 50 or 55 or whatever it was, but, but he went 60 miles and he stops and he says, okay, Lord, just call me home. I'm done. 
He's not a dumb man, so, so what's he doing? Let me ask you, do you think he's thinking straight? Do you think he's thinking straight? He's not. How many of us know that sometimes we don't think straight? It, guys, if you don't know, your wife will tell you. Guys, don't tell your wife the same thing. If you're thinking straight, you won't do that. <laughs> right? But, but, but do our brains always work straight? What causes them not to work straight? There's lots of reasons. Let's just stick with the top three or four. Will exhaustion do it? Will exhaustion keep our minds from working right? Absolutely. Will, will Satan show up when you're exhausted, Christians, to steal your witness? Absolutely. He knows every trick in the book. In fact, he don't even have a book. There's not enough dirty tricks and not enough books to hold all the dirty tricks that he's got. He's got no boundaries on how evil he can go. Stay rested. It's really important. Our tempers get up. Uh, we get, get irritated real easy. All kind of stuff when we get tired. So that's important, right? Uh, what else? How about frustration? How long does it take? It takes a little while to get tired. It don't take no time to get frustrated. Have you noticed that? And how do we act when we're frustrated? How many of us have ever had to apologize to somebody because we spoke in frustration before we realized what we were doing? And how does it affect our Christian witness? This prophet, this amazing prophet, one of the two prophets in the Bible who actually didn't die, one that's going to show up on the Mount of Transfiguration, is said, let me die. Now, Jewish people were heavily against suicide. Right? And uh, so somebody should have told Judas that, but, but heavily against, if you're under the influence of the other side, he's not doing it. He said, you just come, come take my life now. Look what he says. It said, it's enough. Now take my life, for I'm no better than my fathers. Well, who are his fathers? Well, Moses, right? Moses, uh, he's mad because remember, the people didn't follow him after he won the war, after God won the war through him. They went back and, and they're as afraid of Jezebel as he is. Right? So nothing's changed. So what was it all about, God? Why did I do it? Uh, Y'all remember Jonah on the cruise that he took? Y'all remember that trip? And, and, and when, uh, after all that and after being in the fish, you know, why did he not want to go to Nineveh? Do you remember? He says, I know what you're going to do, God. They're going to repent. You're going to let them go. And you know how I hate them. <laughs> He was mad at God because God didn't do it his way. Right? And so he's gone all this. And, and just like Moses bringing all those people through the wilderness and all that kind of stuff and get them, and, and they're still rebellious and they're, they're giving Moses a fit and all. And, and you don't see anybody following behind him except for his servant, do you? So it, was it all for nothing? That was a pretty massive battle on that hill. Pretty spectacular, would you agree? Was it all for nothing? What's it all about if it's not happening? So think about that. He's disappointed in God. Anybody ever been disappointed in God? Come on, church. Be true if you're in church. Right? We can get disappointed in God. Now, we can by faith say we know He's always right, but there's times when He doesn't answer our prayer when we want, how we want, that we can get disappointed, can't we? What are you thinking, God? And, and now hopefully we don't come out with that tone, but it means the same thing. Right? And, and, and that's kind of where he's at. You're just going to misuse me, God? <laughs> After all this, I'm no, you did the same thing with all those other ones, all those other prophets that have gone on before. Jesus comes back and says, you killed the prophets. Right? Isaiah was... Uh, we're told that he was sawn in half in a tree. And, uh, uh, of course, they kidnapped and threw uh, Jeremiah in a cistern for a while. And all kind of stuff that went on. You, you know, all that stuff. He says, am I any better than my father's? He's exhausted. So what does he do? He lay and slept under the broom tree. And suddenly an angel touched him and said, arise and eat. Now remember what he's saying. He's saying what? In a drought, he found a brook with water in it. And God let it go dry. But he, he took care of it, sustained him there for a long time. The crows brought the grub hug food to him, right? On, on schedule every day and fed him. He's seen these miracles. The, the, the widow with the, the oil in the water, uh, the flour in the, in the oil, excuse me. What happened then? Every day, 
That was just enough. Now, think about it. The brook went dry. Did they, ever, did they wake up every morning? I wonder if he's going to put some back today. <laughs> and he was faithful, and he did every day until it was time to go. And then her son died. And God used him to do what? Bring life back. Then all that was defeated, but now he's exhausted, and he's mad, and, and he's having a pity party and, and all that kind of stuff under a, a, a very poor shade looking for comfort. And an angel comes to him. Not crows this time, but an angel comes to him. And he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water, and he ate and drank and lay down again. He's resting. All right? At least he's not asking God to take him home again, but he, he's resting. <laughs> and the angel of the Lord. Now, this is a different, different situation. Anytime you see the words angel of the Lord in the Old Testament... It's generally, if you, if you do check everything out, talking about God. Now, God shows up three ways. If you can see Him, which one is it? It's the Son. But you say, wait, He's not born yet. So what we call Jesus appearing before is the pre-incarnate, not, not flesh yet, Christ. And you say, Brother Darrell, no, he, he was born through... Well, the Bible says in the beginning was the what? Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God and the Word became flesh. He always was. Right? But, but He shows up. So we see that God personally, when you see Angel of the Lord, go check those out in the Bible. Do, do your research there. Right? And, and you'll see that, that pattern there. He says, The Angel of the Lord came the second time and touched Him and says, Arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. He's not there yet. Now, what's he been doing? Running away. And what does God tell him to do now? Keep going. <laughs> You're not there yet. Uh, my, my grandfather uh, was riding a horse for a brother-in-law of his that had a hard time running off with him. So my grandfather got him, and, and he, he, they'd bring horses like that to him. And, uh, he was working sheep one day. Back before they had all the trees from the forest fires up in Borgard Parish, they ran shree sheep. Um, Big day. Miss Opal, you remember in the Ritter on Wool Day, they would bring all that through. Anyway, uh, the horse took off with him one day. And it was wide open. They cut over the, the virgin timber and stuff. Sheep were going the same way, so he just kept the horse running. A couple miles down the road, he let it stop. And he never had that problem anymore with her. You know, uh, a child goes to run away. If you say, oh, please don't run away to a four or five or six year old child that's running away. Oh, please don't run away. Mama do this. Daddy will do this. We'll buy you a pony. Whatever. You, just as long as you don't go. What did you just do? You empower the child to run the house. <laughs> if they don't get their way, what are they going to do? But how many of y'all had moms like mine? And says, well, you're probably going to get hungry. Let me make you a sandwich you can, you can eat on your way. You know? Is that her loving or being mean? Because yeah, what's she teaching? A big lesson, an important lesson, right? And uh, one guy, she explained it, he said, I'd get out to the curb and wait a while. She'd come out with a, a, a meal for down the road. And she says, you know, wherever you're going, you're going to be late. It's going to get dark soon. You better go. Here's some more food, you know. And before you know it, there's tears and come back in. But the child didn't win. Now, how is it four and five and six-year-old kids already know how to manipulate their parents? They learn pretty easy. Huh? Who taught them? They just got it. <laughs> they can do that. You know, it's an emotional blackmail thing that, that comes about. And if you give in to them, that's what you've got. Well, you, you see that God, the, the angel of the Lord with, with him, he says, Oh, no, if you're running away. You're not there yet. <laughs> Here, you're going to need some more food. <laughs> and so off he goes. Okay. So he arose and ate. And with the strength of that food, 40 days and 40 nights. Running across the wilderness. Remember, he's, he's out of Judah. He's out of the, the promised land. He's out there in, in, in the wilderness. As far as Oreb, the mountain of God. Mount Sinai is another word we use for that. So, the place where Moses got the law is where he's going to wind up. Now, it's not. It's, it's maybe a, a couple hundred miles there. So, it's not 40 days. In fact, some said that he could have made it there in eight days. So, what's he doing for those 40 days? He's wandering in the wilderness. Right? And who wandered in the wilderness? 
the Israelites. And, and why were they wandering? They could have been in the promised land in a very short time. But why were they wandering? Because they weren't in God's will. <laughs> they weren't listening to God. They were rebelling against God. Well, isn't that what he's doing? And he's not thinking straight. Right? He's depressed. I didn't get what I want how I want it. God didn't act like I thought he should have. He's disappointing in, in God. Uh, he, now listen, he's, he's saved. I mean, he's righteous by God. He's, he's a prophet. But he's out of God's will. Can saved people act outside God's will? Can we? Come on. I don't see a thing. It's okay to raise your hand in the Baptist church if you're testifying. <laughs> right? Of course we can. Have we, have we stopped sinning when we got saved? How about when we got done? Did we stop sinning? No, it's a fight every day between the flesh and the spirit, isn't it? And if it wasn't a fight inside you, that means you've only got the flesh. <laughs> right? We're not taking this body with us. It's, it's messed up. It's, 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 it's uh, the corruptible can't put on incorruption. Right? So we're going to all be changed one day and have them get a new body that won't be fighting us that way. But meanwhile, we, we've got that going on. And, and one of the parts of our body is our brain. Uh, I, I shared it at the men's breakfast the other morning. Somebody wrote, it's a bad thing when you get trapped in your brain. And your brain does what it does. It can go to depression. It can go to anxiety. It can go to this. It can go to all those other kinds of things. Talk to psychologists and they can tell you that. Here's the big secret. We're not trapped in our brain. We have our opinions. Do we have to listen to our opinions? We have our thoughts. And how many Christians have wicked thoughts? You can even do this much if you want to. But do we get wicked thoughts? Do we want vengeance? Do we want something that belongs to somebody else? Does that happen? The great thing is, we're not trapped to do it. We take that thought captive. We give it back to the Lord. We're not evil because it's there. We're evil if we act on it. If we indulge it and let it lay there, we're not trapped. What keeps us from being trapped by our brain? We have God's brain. We have the mind of Christ, don't we? We have His Word. My brain can tell me I'm not saved. I'm not going to heaven. I don't deserve it. He can tell me that all I want. But I've got God's Word, Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth, He's your Lord. Believe in your heart, God raised you from the dead. You shall be saved. Does it say unless you've got a broken brain at the moment? Unless you're mad, unless you're throwing a pity party, does it say any of that? Ultimate security is in God's Word because it's all God breathed and God can't lie. Amen? He doesn't know that, so He's wandering, and we do wander when we're not listening to God. What's the compass that brings us back to God? God's Word. How important is it? What happens if we don't refer to it fairly regularly? We're still wandering. We're wasting lots of time. We're not trusting Him. And we're doing, doing all those other kind of things. Where does He wind up? At a place that's documented God was seen. <laughs> and, and He goes there. And he, he went into a cave. Now a cave is much better than a, a, a leafless juniper tree for comfort. And he, He's in this cave look, still looking for comfort. And behold, the Word of the Lord came to Him. God's Word leading Him back. Okay, it's to, to restore him. And it said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now, does God know what he's doing? You remember the Garden of Eden? Where are y'all? Adam, where are you at? Does, does God know where Adam and Eve are? Yeah, so what, when he asks a question like that, why is he asking that? So we think, we engage our brain for something more purposeful than whatever it's doing at that moment in our life. Uh, and here's what he says. That's why we, we understand that he's mad at God. Listen, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, blaming them, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with a sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Let's see. I have been zealous, right? Uh, I am alone, and it's my life. Who's he thinking of here? I don't know if you know it. Anytime our brain's not working right, we generally get very self-centered. We're trying to figure out what's going on. That's normal. It's human, right? But, but we, we, we become self-centered instead of God-centered. Does that make sense? And, and we think about how does this feel and all those kind of things. 
as opposed to uh, the, the, whatever the mission is God has for us. And, and so we can see those typical symptoms. And by the way, you can't convince somebody of that. God will bring them to that point. And in the healing of, uh, of any of those things, depression or whatever, it, it starts to go away again. Right? It's just a symptom of, of what's happening. But it's all about who? Poor me. I've been a hero and God, now I'm a zero. Right? So here it is. And they seek to take my life. Well, he's already said that, God, you can have my life. I'm tired. Right? So what happens? After that. Then he said, well, go out, stand on the mountain before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by. We've heard something like this before. How many of y'all remember when Moses wanted to see God? But to see God, now remember to see God how we are before Jesus has died and all that, to see Him before we've made the thing, then we have to be judged right then, so you die. The wages of sin is death. And, and if it hadn't been fixed, guess what happens if you see God before it's time? You die. So what did God show him? The trail of His glory. And you remember where He hid? In the cleft of a rock. Some people think that this cave was that cleft of the rock. Could have been the same place. So what's going on here? Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. Behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks. That's a pretty good wind. We had a little tin fly off the other day. Across the street, my house and other people had signs blow off. But, but this is rocks. That's a good wind, isn't it? Or a bad wind, right? It's pretty spectacular, would you agree? But the Lord wasn't in the wind. Well, come on, God. you got a big spectacular thing here and that's not what it's about? Didn't He just have a big spectacular thing on Mount Carmel? You mean that wasn't what it was about? Well, surely it would. It's big and spectacular. <laughs> How about what happens next? But the Lord was not in the wind. And uh, after that, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. The whole earth shook. That's a big spectacular thing, but God wasn't in it either. After the earthquake of fire, same thing. Let me tell you, I've got pictures of the Borgard Parish fire, and they're pretty spectacular. You can see it for miles. You can see the plume. They said it carried embers 20 miles. And I saw where they landed in Bancroft all the way from Singer. 20 miles, you know, and started another fire there. Big stuff. It says God wasn't in that powerful thing. I was just announcing He was coming. After the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after that, a still, small voice. A still, small voice. Guess who was in the voice? Guess who was the voice? Church. Could it be we're waiting for the big spectacular moment? When what God wants to do is, is speak to our hearts now? In the secret, the quiet place like we sang about a while ago? Amen. I mean, is that the light that we need to see? It, it's why it was interesting, Miss Opal, when you said a mini uh, 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 the revival. Anytime. God is near. It's not the size of the room. It's not the size of the crowd. It's not the big spectacular moment. It's what God is doing in our life right then. A conviction is as powerful a miracle as a mountain moving. You could have an earthquake and God not be in it. But God can convict our heart to come closer to Him and to give us a mission. And that's a miracle. The supernatural stepped into the natural at that moment. And if we say, well, that's just a little one. No, it's not. It's huge. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, His Spirit came to seal you and begin that changing work, that sanctification, and getting you ready one day for a body that's going to last eternal. And an eternal difference was made in you. Now you say, well, but I'm just me. Well, what if that was your child or your grandchild? How big is that to you? That's getting bigger and spe more spectacular, isn't it? <laughs> we may not think it for ourselves, but you think about someone that you love dearly. Well, God loves you dearly. <laughs> Amen? What's he disappointed in? The spectacular thing wasn't what I thought it was going to be. But what is happening? God is talking to him. He could have missed God 
And in his depression, and in his worries, in his disappointment, he was missing God. Did he have to go here for God to talk to him? No, God's omnipresent. He's anywhere. But he had to do what? Run it out, basically. He had to recover from being so tired. He had to recognize running away didn't fix anything. When you read about the, the, uh, the uh, spiritual armor, where's all the spiritual armor at? Y'all remember? I've got a picture of Kennedy modeling it if, if you need to see it. But where, where's it all at? It's all in the front. The shield of faith is where? The breastplate of righteousness. Not the back plate, the breastplate of righteousness. Amen? It's all out front. So running away from what God wants to do is not the, the way to handle it. It's in that still. Your big miracle may be a wonderful still small voice. I think that sometimes the church is waiting on that big revival and the whole country is going to go back. When I read about Laodicea and that time, that, that last chapter of earth before the, the, the rapture and the, all that, it says it's the apostate time. It's when people have turned away from God. It doesn't call for that re revival at that point. However, the door is still open for individuals. Right? One at a time. The mission is still there for us. What does God do with it? So it was when Elijah heard this that he wrapped his face in his mantle. He recognized he's in the presence of God. Can't see God without dying, be, be judged. And went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Suddenly the voice came, what are you doing here, Elijah? He's not talking about geographically. He's talking about what? Spiritually. Where are you at? You remember when Jesus did the same thing with Peter? Do you love me, Peter? Right? He's doing the same thing here. Where are you at? What's going on? And he said it again. I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. And the Lord said to him, notice he didn't even engage all that nonsense, noise. What can you tell from those words? He's desperate. He, he, he's been hurting. He's come to false conclusions. And, and you could argue each one of those points with him all you want. It wouldn't change nothing. So what did God do? He redirected him. And here's what he says. You should go your way to the wilderness of Damascus. That's all the way at the other end. He's way down here, about 400 miles up. It's a long walk to, for, for his recovery time. When you arrive, anoint Hazael's king over Syria. God's going to use him to, to fight the northern kingdom of Israel to show them the error of their ways. You shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nishi, as king over Israel, and Elijah, the, the son of uh, Shaphat, uh, of Abel, Malona, <laughs> Mahola, excuse me. You shall anoint a prophet in your place. In other words, guess what? You had your time. Your time's not up. And you, you've done your part on the team, and then somebody's going to take your place because I've got a mission that's bigger than you, but you have a very important opportunity in your time. Amen? When do Christians retire? When did, when did your dad retire from preaching? He never did, did he? Just, just on and on and on, Brother Couch, many years, faithful service. Amen? And, and, and we don't retire. We what? We're a witness whether we have a position or not. Amen? And, and so the, here he is. He says, there's somebody going to take your spot when that's done. But the mission goes on and you have a part. Now, can we walk away from the mission? We absolutely can. Shame on us. And here's, I'm going to be very graphic for a second. Forgive me. But we're basically saying when we don't take our mission as that ambassador of the kingdom... They can go to hell and I don't care. I don't care enough to do what God's called me to do. And I'm talking about literal hell. Amen? We're called to be a witness to the lost. They're not our enemy. We shouldn't see them that way. They think they're our enemy. They think we're their enemy. But they're our mission. Amen? Anyway... It shall be that whatever escapes the, the sword of Hazel, that Syrian guy... Uh, that Jehu would kill, and whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha would kill. Judgment is coming. I don't know if you know it. Those ten tribes that were in the northern kingdom, we don't know where they are today. They never did turn back to God. 
Go, go do a little study on that. Because they didn't stay in the mission. They were the people of God. They were the Hebrew people. And they broke away and, 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 and went their, their way. Okay? Then he says this, I preserve 7,000 in Israel. All of those whose knees have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. He said, I've got people, we, we use the term saved, but blameless at the time they would probably use that term. They haven't what? They haven't worshipped the enemy. They haven't picked an imposter. They know the real thing. Notice it's 7,000 exactly. Which tells you who kept them. It wasn't an accident that it came up to that. By the way, in seven, and the seven in the Bible means what number? A perfect number, a complete number, all of, all of those things, right? And, and so, I've got, I've got the remnant. I've got them there. It's not just you. Your brain's been playing tricks with you. Folks, I can't trust my brain. But I can trust God's. Right? And he says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the more I'm in this, the more my mind is being transformed. The more I'm in this sometimes. Right? You've seen the shadow on people's used to be sunglasses. You know, they had the little uh, raccoon looking face. We've been out in the sun too much. Now it's more of a what? <laughs> a windshield across the faces. Uh, one of the jokes on, on the YouTube the other day was... Two crows looking at a guy standing in the field. He says, is that, a, is that a scarecrow or a man? And the guy says, scarecrow. Like one crow said, oh, that's a scarecrow. He said, how do you know? He says, there's no phone up there. <laughs> you know? What if, what if it was this? Where would our minds be if we trusted God more than what our brain was telling us? More than what others wanted to, us to think? All of those things are there. I pray this morning that you count every genuine encounter with God as an amazing experience. That you experience God. And where's He going to be? He rescued Elijah, but how long did He take? How many miles did He walk? When He could have had that experience where? God, I trust You more than my brain. I trust You more than what Jezebel's mood is in today. Right? I trust You. Can we be happy with Jesus if we don't trust Him? Or we trust Him if we're going on our own direction, following our personal passions or momentary emotional letdowns? Are we trusting Him or are we trusting whatever the flesh is telling us? And it's really important that, that we get that because then we get back on the right path and, and life is very different when you're on mission. When you have a purpose. That's way better than me, 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 me. Amen. If you've never made Jesus your Lord. The process is fairly simple. Romans 10, 9. Confess with your mouth. How many have a mouth? Most of you. Right? It has to be yours. Somebody can't do it for you. That He's your Lord. The one you're going to trust to follow. Even above our broken brains. Right? Believe in your heart, they mean sincerely that he was raised from the dead, which means he died. God had to become flesh to be able to die, didn't he? But he did. The wages of sin is death. He paid that debt that we owed, that debt that we owed. And, and he says, if we do those things, confess him as Lord, believe in our heart that he was genuinely raised from the dead, we shall be saved. What can the devil do to undo that? What can you do to undo that? Are you, who's bigger than God? Go ahead and raise your hands again. None of us are bigger than God. Right? For a little while, Elijah thought he was. He was judging God. God, you didn't do this right. Sometimes our brains will tell us, we're, you know, that God didn't do it right. But none of us are bigger than God. So what can break that hold that he has, that ceiling that he has on us through his spirit? Nothing. Uh, if you have lower self-esteem, Jesus died for you. He puts you above Him. How can we have low self-esteem? Because our brain will tell us that. Amen? Our brains tell us all kind of negative stuff about us. Right? Uh, was Jezebel going to kill Elijah before God was ready for Elijah to be gone? Wasn't going to happen. They could have killed him the other three years, couldn't they? But God wasn't going to let it happen. When we trust God, life is different. 
So if you've never made him Lord of life, please do. If you have, we need to embrace that and enjoy those experiences. Even if it's him correct us, we need to say, God corrected me. God came to talk to me. Right? And, and, and celebrate. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father.